Welcome to The Business. I'm Lanry Akinola. On this show, we break down business and its impact on Africa and Africans. Business affects every one of us, whoever we are, wherever we are. This week on The Business. South African Airways requests another government bailout as it struggles to meet repayments on existing debts. Zimbabwe is considering issuing a $3.5 billion government bond after elections scheduled to be held in July. It says the money will be used to clear arrears to foreign lenders. Ethiopia's new Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, has ruled out opening up the country's telecoms and banking sectors, much to the frustration of business. Nigeria's Dangote Cement is looking to list on the London Stock Exchange within two years. If it happens, it could be one of Africa's biggest IPOs ever. And in this week's breakdown, we look at the anti-corruption struggle. As French billionaire Vincent Bolloré faces charges for corruption in Togo and Guinea, what is the state of anti-graft efforts on the continent? Joining me throughout for commentary and insight is broadcaster and Africa watcher Buyiswa Ngobongwana. And in part two, I'll be talking to Malte Lieverscheid, Vice President at Teneo Intelligence, a risk analyst specializing in Sub-Saharan Africa. South African Airways CEO Vuyana Yorana has said the airline needs money now and is struggling to meet repayments on existing debt. If the airline gets more money from the government, it will be the latest in a long series of government bailouts to try and keep the struggling carrier afloat. But guess what? You're from South Africa. Mm. National airlines, sovereign airlines are often seen as a sign of presti prestige and national pride. Yes. But when you can't afford them, they can very quickly become a liability. South Africa has pumped hundreds of millions to try and keep South, uh, South African Airways going. Yes. It's not working. Why do they keep trying? Well, they keep trying, like you said, for prestige, and it's politically a hot potato because we've got elections coming up and a big run-up to that. So a failure of the running of the national airlines would be absolutely disastrous. But the key thing, from my point of view as a South African, is there could be a lot more digging into how we got to where we are. And, and, and also, South Africa has a long list of economic priorities that it needs to address. A sovereign airline isn't necessarily at the top oh, so of that. You would think so, but then again, you have the benefit of having the overview that comes from being distant from the problem. Um, and I think with the joined up thinking that comes with the sharing we're having, not only on TV, but in the internet, there's a lot of, there are a lot of questions being asked about how South Africa can best utilize its money. And what I find exciting is that um, the media is being utilized as a mechanism to build a bridge so that the public can have a voice. We'll have to see if South African Airways can stay up in the air. Zimbabwe is considering issuing a $3.5 billion sovereign bond, it says, to pay off international lenders. The issue could happen after elections scheduled for July. This, well, this is, of course, part of President Emerson Mnangagwa's efforts to change Zimbabwe's image, re-engage with the international community after Robert Mugabe was removed from office late last year. Mm -hmm. But it's borrowing what Zimbabwe should be doing right now. The economy is already struggling. It's very cash-strapped. Yeah. One, one understands the need for some money, but uh, what, what's the end game here? What are they trying to achieve? Well, it, it's the difficulty of every African president trying to get a little foot in the door of the capitalist network that is pretty much already locked in tight over hundreds of years. So Mnangagwa has also got the double problem of um, offsetting the reputation of Zimbabwe that was created by Mugabe who challenged the very basis of the capitalist system and tried to go a different route but got no support because the bigger picture is controlled by these players that we're discussing within this so I don't think he actually has many options um, other than to do this and then all he's going to do is take Zimbabwe back to point zero where they quote unquote literally do not owe any money but some would even question why aren't we questioning what the debt really is? Because Africa is financing the world effectively at the moment. It looks like the post-Mugabe era will be easier said than done. Ethiopia's new Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, has ruled out opening key sectors of the economy despite frustration from local and international business. Abiy took over as Prime Minister from his predecessor, Haile Mariam Dessalen, 
who resigned in February amid growing popular pressure for reform in the country. Viswa, Ethiopia has been one of Africa's fastest growing economy mm. for much of the last 10, 15 years or so. That's but, right. but two issues continue to hover over this story, which is that the telecom sector and banking sector, for some reason, remain closed off. Well, it might actually be good for Ethiopia in the long run in terms of her actually deciding to take control of some aspect, a major profitable aspect of her own economy but you know it's a bittersweet thing for the ordinary Ethiopian because the price of having a government like that is effectively a very smooth seemingly benign form of dictatorship. Well what they say is that we're emulating China here, we're emulating Korea here where you know you have strategic opening of the economy in line with national priorities. Yeah. There is some sense to that. I mean you know liberalizing completely hasn't worked out that well for, for many African no, countries. No and it's just taking those small baby steps but simultaneously is he bringing Ethiopian people along with him? In fact do they even know the consequences financially and in terms of job creation of these kind of moves? Those are the nitty-gritty discussions that are missing in all these big economic headlines lines which are specifically designed to be mysterious so we don't know what the hell they're talking about. It looks like economic opening will be slowly but surely for Ethiopia. For our big story this week we look at Nigeria's Dangote Cement's plans to list on the London Stock Exchange within the next two years. If it happens it could be one of Africa's biggest IPOs yet and marks the latest stage in the evolution of the Dangote company from a local Nigerian business into a pan-African player with ambitions to become an international company. Biswa, you know, there's a lot of jargon around this, IPO, stock markets, is this and that. The core of this story is that you have a local Nigerian company that has not only you know grown to become quite a big player in its home market it's expanded all over Africa and now it's looking to, to list its shares on the London Stock Exchange which basically means they can tap into even more money mm. right? and they can yes. access this sort of international yes. sphere which very few African companies are able to do so it's kind yeah. of an interesting uh, trajectory here and a, a nice precedent for the continent. And look how long it has taken how many hundreds of years has it taken for an African company that uh, follows the rules, so to speak, joined the capitalist mechanism and has succeeded very well? And so now it'll be interesting to see how tightly closed those doors are as they make their first initial public offering, what you're calling the IPO. Um, um, but and many Africans are actually arguing, well, hold on a minute, we're just coming in at the back door um, towards the end of a system that's dying on its feet. Why are you following this model, you know, Dangote Cement? Why not do something else with those billions? The argument would probably be that, yeah. well, big companies create lots of jobs. It'll be interesting for us um, who like to have an overview of what's going on to see how easy it is for them to actually get in into the round the table with the big players because effectively that's what he's trying to do. <clears throat> well they, it's not the first time they said they're going to list we'll have to see, wait and see what happens. For this week's breakdown we look at French billionaire Vincent Bolloré, who has been detained in France and is facing corruption allegations in Togo and Guinea relating to events back in 2009 and 2010. The claim is that his company supported presidential campaigns in exchange for highly lucrative contracts. Well, this story has made international headlines. It ticks all the, bo the, the, the boxes yeah. as far as sensationalism goes. You've got billionaires, corruption in Africa, African politicians. But there's something more interesting here, which is that people like Vincent Bolloré historically have been completely untouchable when mm -hmm. it comes to corruption in Africa. Mm -hmm. We know that big multinationals are engaged in corruption, but it's virtually unheard of yeah. that someone at that level would be detained and investigated. Surely yeah. that has to be a good precedent. It's a very exciting time in terms of actually seeing the unraveling of a system that really, even if you look at it logically in a scientific manner, um, is actually degenerating in within itself. So this is to me, just one symptom. And he's just one. He's a perfect mirror of all of them. We all know corruption is a problem in Africa. The estimate is that it costs something like $50 billion a year to the continent. But very importantly, there are big international players mm. are critical in facilitating some of this corruption out of Africa. And they have 
historically been you know, beyond the reach of the law. So it's, it's quite interesting and potentially quite important that now you have authorities properly investigating this. Shell yes. and E&I, two major oil companies, are currently preparing for trial, corruption mm. trial in Italy. These are really, really exciting times. You know, we're talking about transparency. And before we would talk about it as a theoretical construct, but now we've actually got uh, concrete um, issues to deal with of unemployment, of immigration, that are actually forcing the conversation to so that we can look at this. I don't think uh, this guy is being investigated because something amazingly wonderful is happening among that sector of people. It's because he's been forced to. And this is, I suppose, the sacrificial lamb who will be watched very closely to see how he is dealt with. And then the others will watch to see what other mechanisms they can have to protect themselves. I, but we get the picture more clearly than I, ever. I hope, it's great news. I hope you're wrong, Vuyiswa, but we'll have to wait and see. So corruption is not easy to tackle, but perhaps it is possible. We'll take a quick break now. Join me in part two when I'll be talking to Malte Lieverscheid, Vice President at Teneo Intelligence, a risk analyst specializing in Sub-Saharan Africa. Back to the business, the show where we break down business and its impact on Africa and Africans. I'm Lan Rankinol and I'm pleased to have with me Malta Lieverscheid, Vice President at Teneo Intelligence, a risk analyst specializing in Sub-Saharan Africa. Malta, thank you very much for joining me on the show today. Thanks for having me. Now, business is all about confidence. Confidence is key. Business loves certainty and predictability. In West Africa, in the Sahel region, that is uh, roughly you know, sort of south of Algeria, north of Nigeria, if you want to put it that way, we have in recent months and years uh, seen a bit of an escalation uh, in terms of militancy and instabil general instability in the region. There's talk of you know, uh, groups linked to ISIS, groups linked to Al-Qaeda, you know, sort of proliferating across the region. And it all sounds very scary. How big of a problem is this? We have seen this rise, and I can give you the numbers as well. So from 2016 to 2017, the uh, uh, number of incidents associated with Al-Qaeda-linked groups in Mali and Burkina has uh, almost doubled. And um, even now in 2018, we have already counted um, some 80 or so yeah. incidents. And it was a very high profile attack just a couple of months ago as well. Exactly, so it, it's spreading downwards, it's spreading south, south to, um, to um, Ouagadougou, um, that's the attack you just mentioned. Uh, we also see um, the attacks taking a different shape. So uh, previously um, there was much more um, focus on, on soft targets on behalf of those militants and now we see the switch there really going for the hard targets. Um, the one in Ouagadougou, they, they went after the French embassy and the army headquarters. So this is as hard yeah. security as it gets in uh, Burkina Faso. Now, uh, who are these groups? Now, there's all sorts of speculation. We know that there are groups, there's a group called uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, which I believe traces to Algeria. There's talk that Al-Shabaab, you know, has links to the region. There's talk of Boko Haram having links to various groups. Like, are there any numbers on this? Is there is there any sort of real information on where these groups are, how they operate, how they're funded, you know, yeah. how are they able to get away with this? Indeed, information is rather scarce in this part of the world, but what we do now is there has been um, a merger of um, Al-Qaeda-linked Islamist groups uh, basically operating from Mali um, that took place in March last year. And ever since, we have seen this dramatic rise in, in uh, incidents not only in Mali, which still is the epicenter of this uh, conflict, but as I said, it's spreading out, it's spreading into Burkina, northern Burkina, southern Niger. And th this is pretty difficult territory because, you know, I, people might be watching this thinking, well, why can't the police just go out and get them or the military? I mean, we're talking about, you know, thousands of square kilometers of basically desert and, you know, and, and, and terrain that is almost impossible to cover or traverse. So, um, you know, you're looking for the proverbial needle in a haystack, uh, which, which raises the question of what do you do about it? Now, there's a very high profile initiative being championed by Emmanuel Macron called the G5 Sahel Security Force, the first major international effort to actually set up some sort of uh, military response or some sort of security response to this. It's pretty new. You give us a bit of a sense of what this is all about and, and how this might work. Is it going to work? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, the G5 Sahel Force is uh, just the, you know, the new kid on the block, I, I would uh, term it, because there actually is quite a lot of international military engagement going on in the region already. So we have the French uh, Operation Barkhane, uh, which operates across the Sahel, 4,000 4, soldiers, which is the largest French overseas deployment uh, as of today. Uh, we also have in Mali uh, MINUSMA, a 10,000 strong um, United Nations force. Uh, and then we have uh, quite a few bilateral um, um, missions going on, funded by, again, the French, the EU, the, the US. And, and the US, interestingly, is trying to keep a low profile, but yeah. it, it, the, the, there were a couple of deaths you know, a few months ago, which kind of sh shone the spotlight on that. So, okay, so you've already got quite a few boots on the ground, as, as they say. What difference is adding a few more thousand going to make? Is, is this, it sounds like it might be a bit of PR. It definitely does, yeah. Um, so the approach here is it's twofold. One, uh, this new mission is supposed to address one specific gap in this overall approach that I've just outlined, and that is um, guarding the uh, or patrolling the shared borders in this region, uh, which is something that neither MINUSMA, which is again exclusively focused on, on Mali, nor the French Balkan have uh, previously done. So address that kind of gap which which needs to be addressed because as you said porous borders is a key part of the problem here and secondly the second um, uh, driver behind this is to uh, uh, share the burden uh, and involve the regional governments more as they are currently uh, do because for now it's very much driven by um, inter by the French mm -hmm. and by the U.S. So outside military. That forces. was going to be my next question because we're hearing about French troops, we're hearing about U.S. troops, we're hearing about Saudi Arabia funding the G5 Sahel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm not hearing much about Nigerian troops, Malian troops, troops from Niger, etc. Uh, what is the regional stance on this? Um, how can African governments come together here a little bit more effectively to do something about it? Yeah. In fact, we have seen a similar initiative to the G5 Sahel. Um, in, Niger in Nigeria and the, in the Lake Chad region where uh, something called the MNJTF, the Multinational Joint Task Force, made up of Nigeria, uh, Chad, Cameroon and Niger, is supposed to uh, counter the, the menace uh, of Boko Haram in the region. Now, that example is actually, um, I mean, if we take that as an example and make some inferences as to where the uh, G5 Sahel is headed, then uh, I'm not overly <laughs> enthusiastic about it because um, there has been a lot of talk, a lot of window dressing, but when it comes down to it, um, the actual um, difference that it has made on the ground is very, very little. And especially when it comes to joint operations, uh, countries are very hesitant to let other armies operate on their ground. It has made some uh, progress in terms of sharing information, but that is, is basically all it has uh, mm -hmm. you know, produced so far. Uh, uh, it, that suggests uh, that this isn't as simple as a military response. You can't just send soldiers in there and it'll fix itself. Obviously, there is a security element to this, but uh, there's a bigger picture as well. Um, these are, this, re this is also a region that is um, key for migration routes through Africa. And there is you know, the issue of things like the, 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 co the drug trade coming out of South America, which, you know, which has turned West Africa into a bit of a hub going up into, going up into Europe. All of this to me sounds um, like, like it has the makings of quite a complex socioeconomic problem and not just a security problem. Absolutely. Um, I couldn't agree more, right. actually. Um, what we've seen so far is an approach from the international community that focuses uh, exclusively on the on the military aspects and trying to solve it militarily. Part of it is, I think, driven by by the U.S. Um, the U.S. focus on uh, basically or the, the absence of an overall Africa strategy on driven by the State Department. What we've seen is the Department of Defense sort of filling that void uh, and you know doing its its thing, which basically means militarizing uh, U.S. Uh, policy towards the region. So it's actually very difficult to you know take a step back and, and, and redirect the whole thing, come up with a more comprehensive strategy that would, under, um, would address the underlying socioeconomic tensions that actually are, are fueling this conflict. Well, part of addressing those tensions is, of course, um, driving growth, investment, development, and a uh, key part of that is business. So you know, what's, the, what's the, the perspective from business on this? If I'm an investor, if I'm looking at the region, how concerned should I be today and how concerned might I be in future if this problem isn't tackled? Because you mentioned earlier that it's spreading. Indeed. Um, interestingly enough, uh, what we have seen over the past years or so is um, a huge rise in foreign direct investment, specifically going into mining, gold mining in particular, uh, especially in Burkina, but also in Mali. 
And that has gone on uninterrupted. Um, and the reason for that is mainly that um, the um, escalating security crisis that we see is still sort of um, confined to areas of the country where there is an, isn't actually mining going on. All the major mining um, operations that we see in Mali and uh, the southwest, same in, in Burkina and in, in the south. And as long as it stands uh, this way, um, mining operators are actually rather relaxed about well, the It situation. sounds a bit like putting your head in the sand. I mean, it's sort of like, okay, well, it's not here, so fine, we'll just continue. That doesn't sound sustainable. I mean, uh, sooner or later, it's going to come to where you are, right? That's exactly uh, our concern as well. I mean, um, the reason why we haven't seen uh, major attacks on, on mining sites um, is that there has been a dramatic um, increase in insecurity in, in those areas. So we have seen the army going in, beating up civic security, uh, which is fine for now. But bear in mind that these groups that we are talking about, they, they have been able to pull this kind of action up, uh, pull it up yeah. uh, in, 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 in Amenas, in, uh, in, in Algeria, yeah, and in the French in embassy in Burkina Faso, as you said, it doesn't get any more secure than that. Exactly. And then also think about um, the risk of kidnapping, especially on the transit routes from uh, be it mm -hmm. uh, Bamako or Ouagadougou to, to those mining sites. Walter, we're almost out of time. We have just a few seconds left. And um, if you can, just give us uh, so your, your top two or three priorities of what needs to happen uh, to address this and make sure that this problem is properly tackled? I think the first concern would be... Uh, Literally uh, 10 or 15 seconds. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the key thing here is more coordination between the national partners, first and foremost, but also between the national uh, sphere and uh, regional governments, because they need to be involved uh, much more than they currently uh, are. Martin Ivershai, thank you very much for joining me on The Business today. That's all we have time for. Thank you for watching The Business and please join us again next time.